Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to County Executive Pittman's virtual press conference. Uh, this morning, the County Executive is going to share an announcement on efforts to address the opportunity gap. We'll take questions after. Uh, as a reminder, please put your name and media affiliation into the chat, and I'll call on folks uh, for questions in that order. And with that, County Executive Pittman. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm going to start uh, this morning by signing Executive Order Number 47, and this is to create the Anne Arundel County Joint Commission on the Opportunity Gap. And you'll remember back in November, our um, our committee to uh, to eliminate the Opportunity Gap in Education um, submitted its report to Dr. Arlato and myself. Um, this was a joint uh, effort between Anne Arundel County Public Schools and the and the county government. And um, um, that report had uh, 20, let's see, it had four priority recommendations, 14 goals and 78 strategies. And the first of the four priority recommendations was to create a stakeholder group um, that would monitor the, uh, the, the metrics, create the metrics to, um, um, to measure success and um, um, as well as engage the community, hold public forums, um, and um, report back to both the, the school board and Anne Arundel County Council and, and myself and Dr. Arlotto twice a year on progress. So I, I've talked a lot about this um, and you will hear more about this. Uh, it is something that um, really brings together the work that we're doing at the county government in the community and that the school system is doing to address um, a lot of the social determinants of health and the social determinants of educational outcomes. And so there's been a recognition that um, the, um, the, um, the poverty, the housing conditions, um, health issues, uh, trauma um, that, that kids come into schools with um, affects how they do in school. Um, there's no question about that. And so we're all working together to address those. And, and um, so this commission is something that is gonna be 15 members six of whom will be appointed by me, myself, six by Dr. Arlotto, and three will be appointed by the initial 12. And um, of the six that I will be appointing, they come from um, an Anne Arundel County employee, um, a county resident between the ages of 18 and 24, a representative of the county chapter of um, NAACP, a representative of the faith community, a representative with life experience of inequities in the county, a representative of an education-focused nonprofit organization, um, and then the uh, um, the ones that Dr. Arlato appoints will be a youth representative from the student body in the county, um, an early childhood specialist, a, a pupil personnel worker um, within the county school system, a school nurse in the county, a principal um, from a Title I school, and, um, and a representative of AACPS Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, so the, uh, the group that worked on the original, um, the original uh, recommendations put together this executive order, and we will be talking in depth about this tonight at our Tuesday night with the county executive at 6 p.m., and you can access that through our county executive Facebook page um, or um, on the, the county cable, cable station. And I will be joined tonight by Dr. Arlotto and by Carl Snowden, uh, convener of the Caucus of African American Leaders, Pam Brown, uh, director of the Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families, uh, Dr. Marcia Gillens from Anne Arundel County Public Schools, and Dr. Jennifer Purcell um, from my office. So um, we will get into a lot of detail about why this is important and the, the nature of the work that's going to be taking place. Um, but I just want to um, actually sign this executive order and uh, make it official and people can get copies of that. I believe there's a press release going out, proof of signature here. And um, um, I'm really looking forward to getting this work, uh, continuing this work and really monitoring our progress and holding ourselves accountable and one another accountable um, as we move forward. Uh, and then <clears throat> the only other thing that I wanna, <clears throat> I wanna talk about of course is COVID and, and I will ask Dr. Kalyana Raman to say some, some words as well. Uh, but particularly the, um, you know, the, the numbers look good. The numbers are coming down uh, fairly rapidly at this point, um, which is, is uh, reassuring. And the CDC guidance, everybody I think knows about at this point, 
that says that if you've been vaccinated, um, you need not uh, wear a mask um, indoors or outdoors. Um, the governor has removed the restriction on uh, requiring masks indoors and outdoors for everybody because it's difficult to monitor to know who's who's been vaccinated and who has not. Um, the CDC guidance came out uh, the day after we had updated our county employee guidance on masks, and we will be updating that guidance again. But what it will say is that if you have been vaccinated, you need not wear a mask as a county employee in county buildings. Uh, but if you have not been mass, uh, vaccinated um, when you are in county buildings working among others, not in your own isolated office, but among others, um, you will still need to wear a mask. So, um, and I encourage businesses, I know some businesses are still requiring masks of their employees, particularly public facing employees. And, uh, if they're not and if they're not vaccinated in particular, I encourage them um, to require masks um, because um, we, we need to stop the spread of this virus still. So as we think about the possibility of a fall surge, we know that this is a seasonal virus. It's been proven to be so. It was suspected that it would be. Um, any fall surge that happens in this country will be among unvaccinated people. So um, we do not want our county employees to be in that group as part of that surge. And so we are um, giving them an incentive to get vaccinated, which is that they will not have to wear masks when they're working. Um, so for further comments on, on COVID, I will turn it over to Dr. Kalyan Raman, and then we'll take questions. Thank you, County Executive. So <clears throat> I'll start with the data. As County Executive noted, we are doing better in terms of our uh, in terms of where we are with COVID, we're, COVID, we're seeing our case rate is down to 6.7. I think much more importantly, our hospitalizations are um, in the 30s now. And one of the things that we're going to see, particularly as we go through the summer, is that we're really going to pay a lot more attention to the hospitalization rate. Um, because as people get vaccinated, as more and more, and we, uh, as of today, have hit the 50% of all residents in Anne Arundel County having had at least one dose. And that's fantastic. But as we go along, more and more people will get vaccinated and we will be working on that. Um, and so the case rate will take less and less importance and more emphasis on the hospitalization rate, right? Because what we care about is that is to mitigate the serious uh, consequences of COVID, hospitalization and death. We know that some people with, who get the COVID vaccine will get COVID, will get some symptoms. As long as they're mild, that's okay. Um, the vaccines are meant to prevent the severe consequences. And so <clears throat> over the summer, we'll be shifting on that. But it's really important to remember that the guidance from the CDC is around what vaccinated people can do, which is go unmasked, but unvaccinated people need to continue to mask indoors and in many outdoor settings. What's critical to understand is that this shifts the burden from the public sphere of requiring masks to individual personal responsibility on this issue. Um, it's critical to remember that while I said that 50% of people have had at least one dose, that means 50% of people have not. And so we still do need to make sure that our actions are not harming others. And so continuing to mask if you're unvaccinated and going and getting that vaccine so that even if you do get it and you think you'll be okay, you do not spread it to others. Um, Critical to this is that the age, uh, the age uh, range for who can get vaccinated dropped. Now, 12, now it's 12 and over um, with the FDA and ACIP approval last week. Um, we're seeing that our school clinics are, are getting subs fully subscribed. We've actually uh, increased the amount of uh, vaccine in one of our school clinics that's gonna happen tomorrow. Um, really want kids to come out and get this. The consent, for students is in our is in our registration system. Uh, kids 16 and older just need to have that consent signed. They can they can come in on their own. However, 15 and younger, they do need a parent or guardian to accompany them um, to the to get a vaccine. We're also working with pediatric practices to provide them the vaccine so that kids can get vaccinated with their pediatrician. Um, and then uh, lastly, we are we are um, we want to make sure that folks recognize that. The groups at risk still include those are who are immunocompromised. Um, while the vaccine does work, they're still at danger from consequences of circulating COVID. 
And then those also in forward facing or service industry type roles. We talked a lot about that group at the beginning of the pandemic, and they're still they're still one of the higher risk groups because of their exposure. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Kalyana Raman. And with that, we'll take questions. Again, if you could put your name and media affiliation in the chat, and I'll go in order that the questions come in. James Cook from the Capitol. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this question is for the county executive, and this is from the uh, meeting last night. I know there are conversations about trying to uh, save the outside dining that's been under the state of emergency or the emergency order. I'm curious, I know that the Councilman Nathan Bulky has the order to end the emergency. He's talked about his own bill. I'm curious, do you guys have any insight on what it's going to look like when you are trying to keep these uh, outside dining privileges? Will there be capacity restrictions? Will there not be any, any kind of insight on that, Ken Executive, that you can share? Yeah, that's exactly the um, the details that we're looking at right now is is um, the guidance that originally went with the um, um, the authorization to be able to do these these out, uh, tents and outside dining um, had table distancing of six feet and it had some restrictions that were COVID related that are not in effect anymore. And so um, we are um, um, in conversations today about what um, what that should look like. Um, we we want to loosen. Um, some of those restrictions, but we don't want unlimited numbers of people packing into tents in a way that's unsafe. So um, that's the that's the primary um, issue right now. Um, our our bill will um, will actually reference that guidance, um, so um, we can change that guidance and and we'll talk to the council about what they think is right, um, and I'll certainly talk to Councilman Volke about about you know which bill goes in and and we'll all work together to to accomplish the same thing. Um, I just had one quick follow up on that. Is it possible to introduce the bill on Thursday? I know one of the rules for the county is that you have to be in the Annapolis, you have to be in the seat of the county, but you guys are going to be at the high school. Is that possible? Are there any complications from that? I have not heard of any. I have been told that we could. Um, you may have found a uh, um, a little hitch and um, we'll look into that, but I, I um, uh, I've been told that we could, so. Okay, thank you, sir. Next up, Rachel from the Capitol. Hey, um, uh, thank you so much. And um, County Executive, I have a question for you um, re regarding um, uh, the, um, the commission you had mentioned, um, you know, uh, discussing the opportunity gap um, I'm sure you're aware there's also sort of a, a discipline gap in Anne Arundel County that's discussed along with that in terms of um, uh, how um, black students in schools are disciplined um, disproportionately and more frequently than their white classmates. Um, there's still an open um, federal um, U.S. Department of Education investigation into the discipline gap in Anne Arundel County that has been open since 2012 and hasn't been resolved. And it looks like uh, based on the data from last year, um, nearly half of all expulsions were for black students, um, or expulsions and suspensions for black students. Um, I, I, what I'm getting at is, um, you know, I, I guess, how are you thinking about other factors like the discipline gap as you approach that issue? Um, well, that's a part of what the commission's recommendations included. They, they looked at discipline as well as, as, um, academic issues, community issues, um, and, and, uh, um, issues related to poverty and income and race. Um, so, um, and, and that's why it's, we have got everybody at the table for this, including the police department, um, who has, um, SROs and, uh, you know, you know, they're doing work, um, to um, um, divert people, uh, kids, um, before they actually get booked for anything um, into, into counseling and, and services. Um, but um, everybody's at the table. So um, the discipline issue is part of the ultimate um, um, 
achievement gap, which still exists. We call it the opportunity gap because we're we're focusing also on on the opportunities as people go in. But um, it's all it's all part of the work. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the chat right now. Give it one last call. Any last questions for the county exec? Sorry, this is Rachel again. Um, uh, and actually, um, Mr. County Executive, I I'll ask you about something that was discussed um, at the school board last night and actually ended up in a um, split vote at the school board, which is they were considering a motion um, that would have required all students on sort of the wait list for hybrid learning uh, to be back in school by May 24th. Um, but that would have uh, possibly required um, that the district rescind some accommodations that had been offered to, to teachers to make that possible. Um, is that something you've been following at all? And do you have any thoughts on uh, which way the board should go with that? I do not. I mean, these are really, really difficult issues um, as we as we get very close to the end of the school year. And I know that it has been, um, there, are, there are a lot of logistics that, that um, come into play when you're reorganizing classes and, um, and have made those, those accommodations available to teachers. And um, um, it's, it's um, we would all like to have all the kids back in school now. Um, I mean, I know that my kids signed up for four days and ended up with two and it's, it's um, you know, we, we live with that in these circumstances. We've all sacrificed a lot and, and it's not over. And, and um, you know, when you, when you change the number of kids in a class and you go from virtual to in-person, there's a lot of, there are a lot of staff um, issues and a lot of other changes that have to be made. So um, I think that I am absolutely not going to get in the middle of the conversation and, and try to direct it either direction. Um, Dr. Arlotto and his team are working on this and, and uh, the school board is, is um, um, you know, has, has every right to, to make their views known. Uh, thank you. And if, if someone from the districts on the call, do, do we know how many teachers have, have been given accommodations? Uh, Rachel, it's Bob Mosier. I don't have the number right in front of me, but I'll get it for you in the next few minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone, seeing it. No other questions in the chat. We'll wrap things up. Thank you all again for joining us uh, this Tuesday morning.